So we are going to be talking this afternoon about uh, the AMD SEV SNP feature and specifically an update on the open source development that's been going on related to that. Uh, my name is David. I'm going to be starting things off giving a bit of an overview of what that feature is and some of the uh, important flows with it. And then I'm going to hand things over to Brajesh here. He's going to be talking about some of the patches that he's been working on uh, and have sent upstream related to SNP. So the SNP feature is the latest evolution of the AMD SEV, or Secure Encrypted Virtualization Technology. Uh, if you've been to past security summits, you probably had to endure me talking about it. And SNP is the newest version. It uh, is a substantial security update to the SEV feature. In particular, it offers uh, some stronger protection against various kinds of hypervisor-based attacks uh, and builds on top of the previous versions of the feature. So initially, we had the SEV feature, which uh, had memory confidentiality with memory encryption, and then the ES feature, which added register state protection, and now SNP is uh, the third generation of that. The Initial SEV and SVES features are currently supported upstream. They've been supported in hardware since the first generation Epic server processors. SNP is the newest version. Uh, it premiered in the third generation Epic processors, which became available, I believe, in March of this year. And this is our uh, entry into confidential computing. I mean, this is our confidential computing solution. And uh, it can be used in a variety of use cases, but you can think of public cloud as being a, a primary use case for this type of technology. So as far as the threat model goes, it's very similar to other kinds of confidential computing technologies. The trusted components include the AMD provided silicon, so that's the CPU hardware, as well as the uh, AMD signed firmware. And then, of course, we trust the operating system within the guest VM itself to do its best to protect itself. Everything else is untrusted, so the hypervisor, the other VMs in the system, external devices, etc. The threat model uh, goes into specifics of what we are and are not protecting against with this generation of the technology. I talked more about this in my presentation a couple years ago. We also have a white paper that goes into these in more detail. As a summary, though, we have a few big categories of things. So we have confidentiality protection, which is primarily handled through the AES engine in our memory controller, so we encrypt the guest memory. We have integrity protection, which prevents the hypervisor from manipulating or corrupting guest memory, and I'll talk a bit about how that works. We have some physical access protection for things like cold boot attacks, uh, which is, again, accomplished through memory encryption. There are also some new controls around protecting against malicious interrupt injection, uh, bad CPU ID values, as well as certain side channels, including speculative side channels. Uh, the SNP technology as it stands today does not protect against things like availability attacks on the guest, so the hypervisor retains control of scheduling and system resources. More advanced physical attacks, including uh, active voltage tampering, as well as uh, other types of side channels, such as monitoring page faults over time and things like that. So I'm going to talk about a few things in particular that are going to be relevant to the patches that Brajesh is going to be discussing later. One of those is around the integrity, which is really the big new thing with SNP. And this is enforced in the hardware through a new structure called the reverse map table. This is a large memory structure that's allocated at boot. There is one entry in it for every 4K page of uh, assignable DRAM in the system. And those entries are 16 bytes each, and they indicate the owner of that page. So that could be the hypervisor. That's the default. It could be a specific guest at a specific guest physical address. It could be uh, what's listed here as firmware, which would be it's reserved for use by the AMD secure processor, which helps manage the life cycle of these guests. The RMP's primary job is to enforce writability in order to enforce integrity. And so it makes sure that only the correct entity is able to write to those pages. That checking is done in hardware, uh, both in the CPU as well as the IOMMU. So, uh, device DMA goes through the same sorts of security checks. 
a violation of uh, the RMP table results in a page fault or a nested page fault, depending on the circumstances, or an IMMU page fault if uh, it's DMA. And the RMP table itself can only be manipulated through special x86 instructions uh, that are designed to enforce the security properties. So as an example, I want to talk about uh, this concept called page validation, which is about how we get pages into the guest address space. And this uses some of those new x86 instructions. By default, pages start in the hypervisor state, so they are accessible to the hypervisor. They cannot be written to by the guest. The hypervisor first assigns the page using an instruction we call RMP update. And that changes the RMP table to switch over the ownership, but it is not yet accessible by the guest. The guest then has to accept the page by doing something called validation using the pvalidate instruction. And it uses that to transition the page from that guest invalid state you see over to uh, the guest valid state. When once the page is in that guest valid state, then the guest is able to read and write it normally. Uh, I should mention that this is specifically for private memory in the guest, so memory that the guest does not want to share with the hypervisor. We also, of course, support shared pages, which are accessible by both and are used for things like DMA and hypervisor communication. Those pages stay in the hypervisor state. So when the guest accesses memory, it can access it either as encrypted or unencrypted using something called the CBIT. And if it accesses the page as unencrypted, it should be a hypervisor state page. If it accesses it as encrypted, it needs to be a guest valid page. And this two-step page validation sequence is very important for security. And there was a discussion about this on the mailing list upstream recently, I believe, uh, that the page validation ensures that there is only one GPA to SPA translation that's valid at any given time for that GPA. And so it's very important that the guest OS does not execute pvalidate multiple times on the same GPA, because that could potentially create multiple GPA to SPA mappings that a malicious hypervisor could switch to at will. So it's important that the guest tracks what page it's validated and make sure that it never double validates a page. So the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is the launch flow, since that's, of course, how we get started. The launch starts with a plain text image, which I think is rather common in this, this area. And the hypervisor works with the AMD secure processor to get the guest going. The AMD secure processor, for those who aren't aware, is our little embedded security subsystem. There's an ARM core in there and some crypto hardware. And there's an API that, and we have the specs for this on our website, with the various commands that the hypervisor can call. And so the first things it's going to do is it's going to allocate what we call a guest context page that contains information about the VM. And then it's going to call this activate function, which will generate a random encryption key and assign it to that specific VM. The next step is we're going to go through this launch process. So there's a launch start command that creates the context. And then the hypervisor can call launch update multiple times to add memory pages into the guest. And then finally, a launch finish command that closes the context. The initial memory image, in the case of um, the open source patches typically consists of the OVMF image, as well as the CPU register state. So that'd be the reset state for the, the VM. And then there's a few other things in there too. So going into a bit more detail there, there's actually six different types of pages that you can add as part of the initial VM state. Uh, the most common type is the normal page, which is just a standard data or instruction page. And when this is added, both the contents and the metadata of the page are measured and are included in something called the launch measurement. So the contents of the page, that's obviously the data. The metadata includes basically the entry in that RMP table. So that's the GPA where the page is placed, uh, as well as the information about the type of page. So in this case, the fact that it's a normal page. As opposed to something like the next type, which is a VMSA page. The VMSA, or Virtual Machine Save Area, is a special page of memory that holds the CPU register contents for the VM. And uh, these contents 
or arbitrary, so you can specify whatever reset state you want. In the case of uh, Linux, we typically use the standard x86 reset image. And this is, you can almost think of it as a runnable page. So this is a page that can be targeted by the VM run instruction. It's marked in a special way in the RMP. Uh, the next thing is we, we have a zero page, which is really just a shortcut if you need a lot of, lot of pages of zero. Uh, we also have an unmeasured page type. I don't believe this is currently used in our patches, uh, but this is a page that can be used to supply information from the hypervisor to the guest, but that information itself is not measured. Uh, however, the metadata is measured. So the fact that you have an unmeasured page at a specific location in your address space, that is part of the measurement. The contents are not. And so this can be used uh, in order to pass host-specific information. The final two types of pages here I'm going to be talking about in a little bit more detail. These are special pages that uh, the security processor helps create. So the first one of those is the secrets page. This is a new concept. Uh, actually, both of these are new concepts in the SNP architecture. Typically, there will be one secrets page in a VM. Uh, the phys guest physical address of this page needs to be at a known location. So the guest is going to be built knowing that it is going to have a secrets page at a certain address. And of course, that is measured as part of this metadata. And there's a structure in our spec that defines what's there. There's some information such as the actual family model stepping of the uh, silicon, which can be important for some reasons, uh, some fields to help with live migration. But really, the most important thing in this page are a set of keys that are called the VMPCKs, or Virtual Machine Platform Communication Keys. Uh, these are ASGCM keys that are used for secure communication between the guest VM and the AMD secure processor. So we have this mechanism that we call a guest request, where if the guest wants something like an attestation report or some uh, certain types of key derivation to get ceiling keys or things of that nature, it can construct this encrypted message and send that through the hypervisor to the security processor. And the security processor course, has these same keys, and it can use this to verify that the message is authentic and provide a secure response. So, uh, so the, these keys are, are very important. I'll talk about the attestation in just a little bit here. The last type of special page that we support in the architecture is a CPU ID page. And this is a page that is filled in initially by the hypervisor, and then it's filtered by the security processor. And the security processor verifies that the hypervisor does not violate any security properties, as we define it, when supplying CPU ID information. CPU ID information, in some cases, is completely harmless. Um, the values that really don't matter. There are other cases where we are concerned that there could be security issues in the guest if it were to get bad information. An example of this would be something like the size of the XSAVE area. Uh, if the incorrect size information was provided, it could lead to a buffer overflow in the guest, or something like that. So the hypervisor fills in this table with information for various CPU ID leaves that it thinks the guest is going to need. And if those do not pass a security policy, we'll fail the launch update. What that means is that if the guest is actually running and is and has managed to get through the launch update and, is, uh, and launch finish, then all the information in that page is safe. And so the guest can consult that page for any CPU ID needs. It doesn't need to go back to the hypervisor uh, for CPU ID emulation. The specific rules that are used to enforce the security are documented in something we call the PPR, the uh, Processor Programming Reference. Uh, that is a public document. It's on our website, and there is a table here with the information on each leaf, in some cases for each field, what security checks apply. Uh, because each, different, each generation of processor that we make has different CPU ID functions in it, uh, that's why this information is in a uh, processor-specific document. So if you look up the PPR for family 19 hex, which is our third generation EPIC, then you'll find the security policy table here. And there's a few different types of common checks that are used depending on the field. All right, so 
At this point, we have created the launch context. We have done launch update to install pages into the guest. And then the final step is to do this thing called launch finish, where we can supply an ID block. Uh, this is another new concept in the SNP architecture. The ID block is something that is created and signed in advance by the guest owner, and it contains the expected measurement that we are going to verify as part of launch finish. It also contains some information about policy, uh, as well as various unique parameters that can be used in key derivation. And one of the most important things is that it is signed by the guest owner using their private key. And this is important because that signature can then be used to identify my guest from your guest versus somebody else's. So technically, this is an optional aspect of the SNP architecture. You can launch a VM without it. However, if you do supply an ID block, then that is used in both key derivation as well as in attestation. And Rajesh is going to talk in a bit more detail about attestation and some ways that it can be used, but I want to give you a high level first. During runtime, one of these VMs can ask for an attestation report, and it does that using those VMPCK keys, those ASGCM keys that we talked about a minute ago. And so it creates a message saying, I want an attestation report, and I want this data to be included in it. Uh, that encrypted blob then goes through the hypervisor to the security processor, which will turn around and provide a report. That report contains the identity information, so from that ID block, the VM supplied data, uh, some other platform information, and it is all signed with something called a versioned chip endorsement key, or VCEK, uh, which is a chip unique key that is specific to the TCB versions running on that platform. And so that signed report is given back to the guest who can then supply that to anyone it wants. The remote party can verify that report by uh, taking that report combined with a certificate from AMD. So uh, if you go to our website, we have uh, something called a KDS, a key distribution server. And you can supply a specific part number along with the TCB versions running on that part. And we will give you a certificate, assuming, of course, it's an authentic part. We will give you a certificate uh, that is signed by an AMD root key that you can use to verify attestation reports from that box. An important thing is that that certificate is valid for all the attestation reports coming from that box at that version. So this is not something that you need to go and do every single time. It's more of a at the time you provision the platform type thing. And so you can use that to verify that the attestation report you get back is legitimate. The data in that attestation report can then be used to securely communicate with the guest. And so one example of that that's shown here is a guest generates a public-private key pair and asks for an attestation report that contains a hash of the public half of that key. And that way, when the guest gives that key and the attestation report to a third party, that party can verify the report, and it can know that that key is, in fact, associated with that guest. And so it can then use that to encrypt communication that it knows only that guest will be able to observe. Uh, so that's not the only potential way to use attestation, but that's one of the, the key ways that we see. Uh, and attestation is a very important part of this architecture because until you do the attestation, you really don't have assurances that the guest is running in a secure environment, that it's running at uh, TCB versions that you consider acceptable. So I know that's a very quick sort of whirlwind tour through the basics of SNP. Uh, I'm going to hand things over to Brijesh. He is going to talk through uh, a bit of an update on the development status. So, right. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Brijesh Singh. I've been working on SNP enablement. Uh, in, uh, I'm part of Linux kernel team at AMD. Uh, I did the CV work, and the CV is now on SNP. So I'll just walk through what are the things we have been submitting up stream and uh, get your feedback. So the very first thing which we have been, uh, if you follow the CV and CVES enablement, 
is uh, we have introduced a bunch of ioctals in a KVM driver to create or manage the encrypted virtual machine. So in a CV case, there was like these ioctals for a CV initialization, launch start, launch update, and all those things. The similar con concept is there in SNP. So with the now KVM will have more support called SNP in it, which can be used for initializing the context and it can allocate the ACID because one of the things with the encrypted guest is it need to use a particularly specific ACID range. So with the init, we allocate that ACID and with the launch start command, which uh, David just talked about, uh, is can be called by VMM with all the parameters given to it and KVM will take those parameters, pass it down to the security processor. And uh, launch update, same. It will take all the parameters given by the QMU or any of the VMM and pass it down to the KVM and KVM pass it further down. While passing these uh, parameters down, KVM also does some pre-processing. For example, if VMM gives a uh, guest memory or, uh, or basically guest BIOS, and that BIOS might be put in the virtual address space, and uh, KVM will go and find its corresponding system physical address space and call the PSP firmware commands to encrypt the pages. And then finally, it calls this launch finish is there, which can take all these various parameters like ID blocks and all those stuff and pass it down to the KVM. So one of the new thing which, uh, as David talked about, is in SNP architecture is we allow guests to communicate to the PSP through the guest message request. So there is one, uh, one, one of the things which we have been adding is uh, controlling how many uh, guest requests can come from the guest owner because it can call the starvation. A malicious guest can just start issuing all these bunch of the guest requests to the PSP and could compromise uh, or create denial of service attack. So with the, these ioctals, we can limit the number of the uh, requests you can receive. And uh, for the QMU support, what we have done in the past, there is a new object we added called a CV guest. So basically, you take the Q current QMU command line, which is used for launching a virtual machine. You add the CV guest object in the QMU, and it automatically becomes an encrypted guest. For SNP, all you do is you just at your, instead of using a CV guest, this time you use a CV SNP guest, and it converts that as a SNP guest. There are a few uh, new ioctals also added for the system-wide configuration, such as the platform status. So this uh, ioctal actually gives the status information about the firmware, for example, what version of firmware is being used, and all those details. So you can find uh, all the parameters or all the output information in the SNP specification. And then some ioctals to get the configuration or set the configuration, which is used during the attestation report. So next is the GSCV version. So one of the thing, uh, if you uh, follow the SCV development, right, from SCV, ES, the registers are encrypted. In SNP, registers are also encrypted. So what this basically that means is whenever guest is doing something which causes the world switch, the registers will be encrypted. Guest a hypervisor will no longer able to access those registers. To help that architecturally, there is a notification which goes from the hardware to the guest, telling that guest there is non-automatic exit happening. And then guest can validate what are the register states it wants to expose to the hypervisor. And then, so that's, that all this contract is being done through this GHCV called guest host communication specification. So this specification was developed during the CVES development. And now we extended it to add few more uh, non-automatic exit to support the SNP. So uh, there are a bunch of, uh, uh, you can see many of them, I'll not go through each of them, I'll just go through some important one. So one of the most important one is the page state change. As David was talking that, one of the things which we need to do is, guest need to, before guest accesses a private page, it need to validate that page. And validation is two-step process. First, you transition a page in the RMP table, then you call p-validate. So the page state change, uh, VMG exit, can be used by the guest to ask hypervisor to add a particular page in the RMP table as a guest private page. So that's, that's the page state change exit. And also, then there is new VMG exit which can be used to query the feature 
uh, supported by the hypervisor because in SNP there are multiple features available and it's possible that hypervisor may implement certain feature, other feature may not be yet available. So the, through hypervisor feature VMG exit, a guest can query what are the capabilities of that hypervisor and then act accordingly. It, it, and then uh, uh, another one is the guest message request. So this is the uh, uh, VMG exit which a guest can use to issue a request to the uh, PSP about the attestation report or the key derivations and all those things. And then there are a bunch of other VMG exit which is mainly done uh, to support the uh, inter inje restricted interrupt injection. So those are like AP create and adorable pages. You can find all these detailed information in the GSC specification. The link is there. So let me go through the page validation because it is one of the very important part in the SNP, right? And so page validation, if you look at the specification, uh, then there's this VMG exit called PSC page state change. And a page state change, uh, VMG exit uh, basically takes a structure. And uh, so there is a structure here on the slide. The first thing which a guest does, it issues the VMG exit saying, add this particular GPA as a private GPA in the RMP table. So he issues the request, request comes to the hypervisor, hypervisor goes, finds the uh, system physical address for that page, and then uses the RMP update instruction to add that particular page in the RMP table, then resumes the guest, guest would go and call a p-validate instruction to make that as a final step as a private ownership of the page. So this entire process, when uh, you can actually, through VMG exit, we can batch multiple requests at a time. So you can go up to all the way up to 253 entries and one of the thing in the page state uh, change request is the page size. So guest can actually say that he wants to add this range of the GPA as a two meg. So you can do two meg operation. And it is just a hint to the hypervisor that he wa a guest wants to add this as a two meg. Hypervisor may choose to add those pages as a 4K because if he's not able to back those as two meg, then he may choose to do as a 4K. So in that case, when the, when the guest will go and try to validate the page as a 2 meg, he will get the, he will get the error. P-validate will give the error sign like size mismatch. So that's a hint to the, uh, to, the hyper, uh, to the guest that the page size which you requested was not honored by the hypervisor. But then he can, a guest can go and use the smaller size, which is 4K, to validate those particular range. And this process will keep on continuing uh, to complete the page validation state. So oh, one thing in the uh, integrity, uh, in the RMP table uh, uh, check which Davis was talking about, right, there are two type of uh, uh, RMP fault can happen. One is the RMP fault can occur during the page walk from the host or RMP fault can, ha or nested page fault can happen when the page walk is happening from the guest side of it. So the first one I want to cover is the RM how we deal with the RMP violation fault if it is coming because host is trying to access a guest private page. All these violations will occur if the, if the host is trying to access uh, a guest page. So that page could be sometime a private page or it could be a guest, uh, uh, or it could be a shared page. So the strategy which we have taken uh, is what we do is uh, when the page gets added in the RMP table, we actually unmap that page from a direct map. So that Linux kernel should never ever be accessing those pages because if it accesses those pages, it's gonna see a page fault and there's no way to recover from those page fault. So that's our proactive way of just making sure that page is not present in direct mapping. But the user space can go and try to access that. So when user space accesses uh, a guest memory and we see a host uh, RMP violation, then there are two things which we could do. If it is a write access, then guest, uh, then hypervisor don't have any reason to write to the guest private page. We send a sig bus signal to kill that process. But if it is a read access, that's all fine. We'll, we'll never see the fault. So uh, another, another thing uh, what uh, happens is the host backing page support. So there, there are situations which, where we will run into is that, uh, uh, for example, like uh, VMM allocates a 
backing page as a true MEG backing page. And guest issues a page straight transition says this page needs to be added as a two meg in RMP table. And we will go and add the page as a two meg. But sometime later, guest can come and make one of the sub page within the two meg as a shared page. And ask us to, okay, ask to access the page, ask hypervisor to access the, that page. For example, it could be a DMA page in between that. So when hypervisor goes and attempts to access that page, if hypervisor mapping is not the same page size as what is added in the RMP, then it's going to cause a RMP violation. And to solve that problem, we split the pages on demand. So when, the, when we see the fault, if it is fault is because of the page size mismatch, then we go and split those pages. So that's the strategy for the host. So uh, on, in case of the VM, if VM is trying to access a page and that is causing a page violation, then, uh, uh, then uh, when, the, uh, when, when the page violation, uh, when the RMP check violation happens, then uh, we will get this nested page fault with some uh, additional information about what caused those RMP check failure. So, uh, NP, uh, so there are a few uh, more bits added in the nested page fault. So for example, one of the bit is RMP bit, which basically tells that this nested page fault happened due to the RMP check failure. And then there is a one bit which actually can tell whether the, that particular page was getting access as encrypted, which is C equal to one, or was getting access as a shared. And uh, if, if there is a, some kind of size mismatch, for example, uh, uh, consider the case where guest is trying to pre-validate a page as a 4K page, but the page was backed as a 2 meg, then that's a size mismatch uh, on the hypervisor side, and we get those hints. So when, whenever, uh, whenever we see the uh, nested page fault and the fault was due to RMP check failure, then we go and take some corrective action to fix it. And so one of the uh, action which we do is basically called the RMP update, uh, RMP update or P smash and all those other instruction to resolve the fault. So yeah, there are multiple ways on how the page validation can be approached or can be done here, right? So uh, page, uh, as we said, page validation is one of the key thing. All the memory pages need to be validated before accessed. So there are two approaches we, which we can take here. One is we pre-validate the entire memory before it's getting accessed. So uh, in case of, uh, in the current implementation, what we are doing is uh, we, uh, we have the guest OVMF bias pre-validating the entire memory before Linux kernel is loaded. So what, uh, so this, what this was slide to so in the first one is hypervisor copies some, uh, or puts some data or guest bias in the guest memory address space using the launch update commands. So when launch update command is getting issued, it is copying the data in guest memory space and it is also validating those particular pages. So there are few pages which will be pre-validated before virtual machine is being even booted. So when the virtual machine starts booting, the OVMF bias takes over, and OVMF bias, very first thing he does, as soon as he knows that how much memory is there in the system, he, he uses the page straight transition request to, to add all these pages as a private pages, and then calls the pre-validate instruction to validate the entire memory. So from there onwards, all the pages are pre-validated and a guest kernel does not have to worry about validation. But if guest kernel makes a page a shared page, then it need to issue the page state transition to, to unvalidate or basically change the page state as a shared in the RMP table. There are, uh, another approach which we could take is the lazy validation, uh, which is we do on demand validation. Whenever the page gets access, that's when you validate it. So in this model, what, uh, what we could do is uh, guest OS, guest, uh, uh, guest bias will validate only the memory which he needs during his execution. Then, uh, uh, then there is, uh, uh, in the latest UFI specification, a new memory type uh, is added called unaccepted memory type. And guest bias can build the 
unaccepted memory type table and pass it down to the guest OS. Guest OS can parse that table and validate the section which was not previously validated. And uh, yeah, and yeah. So while doing so, he also uh, probably guest OS, uh, or even in this particular case, uh, uh, guest bias also need to ensure that he's not double validating all those memory. So he, he need to maintain this information uh, in itself. And also another uh, interesting problem could happen if, if guest OS is, wants to do k-exec. Then if the memory is previously validated by the guest OS, then you need to pass that information down to the next k-exec kernel so that the new k-exec kernel would not go and double validate those memories. So uh, one um, next thing which we added uh, uh, in our kernel is the VM attestation driver, as Davis talked about it, right? So one of the thing uh, uh, which uh, SNP provides is provides a method by which a guest can talk to PSP, and uh, to talk to PSP, it need to call the VMG exit specified in the uh, GSCB specification. So. For that, we wrote a driver called uh, SEV guest driver. It provides few ioctals to the user space, and user space can call those ioctal to uh, send the request down to the uh, to the PSP. So, the, uh, from user interface point of view, is uh, uh, is very simple. They'll just open open the device driver and issue an ioctal to it, and kernel driver will go construct the entire packet because when you are sending a request down to the uh, PSP, that request need to be encrypted through one of the key provided by the secret way. And uh, the SEV guest driver will take care of encrypting the packet, sending it down to the PSP, receiving the packet, decrypting it, verifying that the message is successfully decrypted, and then pass down the uh, uh, report to the user space. So it can do the get report, or a key derivation, or there is a, another one is called a get extended report. So the idea behind the get extended report is the same as the report, but it provides some additional certificate uh, which can be configured, a system-wide configuration can be done by the hypervisor. Uh, and this was done through one of the ioctal which I talked about in the very start of the presentation. At AMD, our colleague uh, Jesse and Liam, they have been uh, developing uh, an example application. Is, uh, we are calling it a CV guest driver, which actually makes use of this attestation driver to query the report and val verify or validate the entire chain. So what they have been uh, doing is um, they are extending multi-pass, uh, uh, Ubuntu multi-pass package to first create an SNP guest. So, that's the first change which they are doing. So in, 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 in this, what they are doing is multi-pass uh, client running on a guest owner side, sends a request down to multi-pass daemon, and multi-pass daemon over here creates an SNP guest. While they send the request, they also uh, uh, give this guest owner's public key. And so during launch of flow, one of the things which you can provide is you can provide user data while creating the launch context. So what, what, what that uh, multipass daemon does, it takes the user provided data, the, in this particular case, guest owner's uh, SSH public key, and use that while during the context creation. And uh, boot the virtual machine, and once the virtual machine is booted, then use the attestation driver to query the report. And when you query the report, the report contains uh, measurement and all other additional information. It also contains the information which was passed during this host or user data during the launch, uh, launch uh, context creation. They take that data and give it back to the, uh, to the multiplast client, which goes and verifi verifies the entire certificate chain. And once the entire chain has been verified, they verify the measurement and stuff and make sure that it is actually uh, uh, a guest. Uh, it is actually the guest which they wanted to launch. And while doing so, they also add this in their SSH, SSH known host so that now guest owner can easily connect to the, uh, connect to the cl client or in this particular case VM. So just to uh, summarize uh, everything for 
SEV and SEV ES. So SEV support uh, landed in the kernel 4.15, the host, uh, that's where the guest support went. Hypervisor support went in 4.16 kernel and uh, a QMU 2.12, that's where the SEV support landed and libword 4.5. And from a distribution, uh, distro point of view, I think uh, from Ubuntu 18.04 has the uh, SEV guest support and then later version of Ubuntu or Fedora uh, have uh, support for SEV hypervisor. All the RHEL uh, have a good support for the, this. And uh, yeah, SEV has, has recently landed. And one thing which we are right now working on uh, is the live migration support for SEV and SEV ES. So let me quickly go uh, to the SEV SNP. For SEV SNP, I've been submitting the patches for uh, almost four to five months. Uh, we have been getting very, very good feedback from the community. And uh, so far, we have reached to the version 5. Uh, we are feeling very pretty confident that uh, things are going in the right direction. And for guest OS, uh, for guest BIOS, uh, we have been contributing to the OVMF. Um, uh, and this slide says it's version 6, but actually, recently, I just submitted version 8. So we are, we are, we are getting pretty close over there. I think guest uh, BIOS patches are in very, very decent shape. What we have, uh, uh, because SNP is a very complicated uh, feature, right? So what we are doing is we are doing base enablement first, and then we will keep on adding the supports as we progress. So what we have support for uh, right now is the guest driver, which you can use to carry the attestation. And then uh, a thing which uh, David talked about, the CPU ID. So the guest, uh, guest kernel, uh, as well as the guest BIOS, they use the CPU ID uh, page to get the CPU ID values instead of going to the hypervisor. And uh, in the current support, uh, we go with the pre-validation approach where OVMF validates the entire, uh, entire guest memory and it supports the multiple vCPUs. Uh, yeah. So where we will be focusing uh, uh, after the base enablement is the restricted interrupt injection. So one of the things which uh, SNP provides, optional feature is provides is to uh, partially disable the inter injection interface from the hypervisor. And uh, it, uh, then hypervisor can use this uh, newly defined uh, exception vector called pound HV to send an event or interrupt to the guest. And then uh, uh, I, yeah, the, the VMCV, uh, sorry, GSCV specification has good information about how all those things can be achieved. And then uh, we will be also working on lazy validation stuff. Uh, where we can speed up the boot time, then we'll work on live migration support. And, uh, and another thing, uh, I'll just touch base real quick, is the VTPM support. So one of the things in the SNP architecture provides is the VMPL, uh, virtual machine privilege level. So here idea is that uh, you can divide the guest address space into multiple privilege levels. So what we can do is, uh, for virtual TPM, one thing which we could do is, we could take and run uh, uh, a code in the VMPL0, a separate code in the VMPL0, which, uh, uh, which is called SVSM. So this is the specification proposed by Microsoft. They have proposed a specification called SVSM, where they are defining what are the things can be. Uh, what, uh, SVSM can provide a bunch of services and they are defining what are the services SVSM can provide. And in this model, it's pretty, uh, what, uh, because when, we, when you divide the virtual, uh, when you divide that as a space, then, uh, then you need to, there are certain instructions which uh, lower VMPL cannot do. For example, p-validate, lower VMPL cannot do that. For that, it has to go to the uh, uh, VMPL zero. And uh, 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 when it goes to VMPL zero, that's the specification will give. I think I'm running out of time. So just, for, just to conclude everything, the SNP support, all the patches are available in the GitHub. Uh, you can download it from there and the full SN, and, and this will, if you have a Epic processor third generation, then this all should both work there. And yeah, and please uh, give us a feedback, review feedbacks and stuff on the mailing list. Thank you.